Hello, good morning. My name is Caroline O'Neill. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of the UNC Campus Ministry, and I also work uh, with youth of all ages here at the church, which is why I have this fancy uh, blue name tag. Um, I am graduating from UNC this year. I'm a senior, um, and I will be working at the Moorhead Planetarium full-time starting a day after graduation. So very, very excited. Thank you. Um, and it's my third and final service um, with the College Unitarian, so very excited to speak to you all today. Um, I, this piece is entitled Home. Home is in other people. Once, when asked what he thought was the most important discovery made by the Apollo missions, Jim Lovell said, We learned a lot about the moon, but what we really learned about was the earth. The fact that just from the distance of the moon, you can put your thumb up, you can hide the earth behind your thumb. Everything you've ever known, your loved ones, your business, the problems of the earth itself, all behind your thumb. Some astronauts recall bursting into tears at their first sight of Earth from space. When asked to describe his experience, Edgar Mitchell, a member of the Apollo 14 crew, said that suddenly, from behind the rim of the moon, in long, slow-motion moments of immense majesty, there emerged a sparkling blue and white jewel, a light, delicate sky-blue sphere laced with slowly swirling veils of white rising gradually like a small pearl in a thick sea of black mystery. It takes more than a moment to fully realize this is Earth, home. There, 250,000 miles away from Earth, the Apollo astronauts discovered home in our humanity. Home is, is in other people. As a college student and now a soon-to-be post-college 20-something, the question of home has been on my mind more and more often. But, even as a child, I thought a lot about home. My lived experience of home, as a child of many moves and of divorce, was liminal at best. I don't remember what the South Carolina house I was born in looked like. We moved to a shiny new white one in the suburbs with tiny trees before I started kindergarten. Then it was three, no, four different houses all the way across the country in Colorado. And then back to the Carolinas and a succession of houses and apartments. The one thing that remained constant with my family my sisters and my father and my mother. It wasn't until I moved into a dorm room, sharing a space about the same size as the living quarters on the Apollo spacecraft, uh, and wondering how those astronauts didn't lose their minds after only an average of 10 days of this, and asking myself if I could stand it for another 196 days, that I finally realized where my home was. The thought came to me when my roommate's grandfather passed away on St. Patrick's Day, and I spent the afternoon, afternoon curled around her in the bottom part of our bunk bed, holding her as she cried. And suddenly I knew that Rose, my roommate, was my home. I got homesick sometime around exams during my second semester and started to call my dad more frequently. Or, I should say, started to call home more frequently. He increasingly became a source of support for me throughout my first year of college and remains so to this day. One of my younger sisters, Lizzie, moved in with him two years ago. Since then, I've watched her blossom into a smart, caring, happy young woman. And I know this is because she, too, has finally found her home in our father. My sophomore year of college, I began to feel like I was missing something. <laughs> Sorry, family's there, so a little teary. <laughs> oh, no, Lizzie, don't cry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my sophomore year of college, I began to feel like I was missing something. So, because I attend a large public school in the South, I rushed and then pledged not a sorority, a fraternity, not that kind of fraternity. <laughs> St. Anthony Hall, a literary and visual arts fraternity committed to the artistic endeavors of its members. Lest that sound too pretentious, which it does, uh, I will admit that although our membership is quite different from the rich, straight, white, male, business and political science majors uh, that populate the other fraternities on campus, we could still take them in a game of beer pong. <laughs> St. Anthony Hall is located not too far from here at 207 Pittsburgh Street across from the Carolina Inn. It's a crumbling, decrepit building designed by an art major uh, rather than an architect or an engineer. <laughs> As you can imagine, this has resulted in quite a few creative structural problems and an overall lack of closets, oddly enough. Uh, my first year at St. Anthony Hall, it rained so much that I spent an entire weekend bailing out our ground floor uh, alongside my new siblings. Despite our best efforts, there was still mold everywhere after the flood. 
I won't even speak on the kitchens or the bathrooms, uh, shared as they are by 30-odd art and creative writing majors who somehow never managed to learn how to mop. (laughs) When my dad and sister came to visit me this fall, my dad told me in almost complete seriousness that we ought to think about setting a fire uh, (laughs) in order to get insurance money for for a new house. (laughs) Uh, But all of this does not matter because I found a home amongst my brethren in that squat and dirty house. St. Anthony Hall serves a beautiful chrysalis for me. I enter as a 19-year-old political science major uh, with long hair and an interest in men, uh, and I'm leaving as a 21-year-old raging liberal lesbian with a queer haircut to match uh, and an interest in translating both the Quran uh, and gay Latin love poetry written by monks for each other in the 6th and 7th centuries. We sometimes call ourselves the island of misfit toys, and these beautiful misfit toys have given me the most transformative home I've ever had. Home is in other people. Yet another home I settled into during these last few years of college is here at the community church of Chapel Hill. I've done just about everything I could stick my hands in at the community church. I've changed your baby's diapers. Uh, I've played dress up with your toddlers. I've taught your tweens about a Palestinian Jew with a radical message of love and equality. They're sitting there, hey, Alex, she's waving at me. Uh, And I've talked to your teenagers about their spirituality. I've loved every minute of it. I joke about Marion being my mom away from mom, and Jeff has started to feel like my dad away from dad uh, as he co-leads the high school youth group with me. I even gained a sister this year in Ellen as we led the UNC Campus Fellowship together and planned a retreat for college Unitarian Universalists across the state. I open my piece today with the words of astronauts, and I'd like to close with the words of the late and great astronomer Carl Sagan. Look at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you know, everyone you love, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who has ever lived out their lives, lived here the aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident ideologies, religions, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, Every saint and every sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceit than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. I think that Carl would agree with me when I say that home is in other people Home is in our humanity. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ellen Saunders Duncan, and I'm the other co-leader of our campus ministry. I'm a member of this church, and I work with some of the high schoolers, and it's so wonderful to be here in front of you speaking today. I'm a student in the American Studies program at the university, and what I'm going to talk about today has been informed by discussions that I've been a part of in that community, as well as conversations that I've had in my UU communities. One of the things that I'm finding is that as humans, we revisit and refine essential qualities about ourselves throughout our lives, spiritually, intellectually, and socially. It's a sort of strange thing, but also very affirming. I feel like the more wide-ranging the experiences I have, the better I know myself, the closer I get to my core and who I am. In his book, Absalom, Absalom, William, William Faulkner wrote, tell about the South. What's it like there? What do they do there? Why do they live there? Why do they live at all? And so that's what I'm going to do for the next few minutes. I'm going to tell you about the South, my South, and how the South is and has become my home. I'm a little nervous to talk about this because the South is complicated and heartbreaking and paradoxical, and people have really complicated feelings and opinions about it. The truth is, people see and experience different Souths. 
There's a monolithic South that, that exists in opposition to the North. There's a Confederate South that exists as a twisted, mythologized memory. There's a creative South where great suffering and stubborn passion produces artistic genius. And there's a global South which values ingenuity, hard work, resourcefulness, and good manners, regardless of where you've come from. My South is colored with strange and idiosyncratic traditions and personalities, a deep and abiding connection to the land, and people whose initial live and let live attitude often gives way to sincere and genuine concern and interest in the lives of the people around them. The South is my home, and it's complicated. I have been a self-hating Southerner for most of my life. I was born in a community in Pennsylvania, much like Chapel Hill, and lived there until I was eight when we moved to Raleigh. In my mom's family, after 11 generations of people born in Virginia, I was the first born outside the South. My middle name is Virginia, though, so it sort of works out okay. <laughs> um, my dad's father's family followed an arc of migration over a few centuries through North Carolina, Tennessee, and settled in Alabama, which he left to then end up in Virginia. I was incredibly resentful of moving to the South. Though I was a kid, I had already internalized a bunch of stereotypes. And though I already knew plenty of people in my own life who proved them to be wrong, I thought Southerners were uneducated, unenlightened, backward, unhealthy, lazy, bigoted. I have since learned that one, the South does not, in fact, have the market cornered on the American caveman. And sadly, they exist throughout our society. Two, a lot of these stereotypes develop as a reflection of our own discomfort with our society's shortcomings, poverty, prejudice, systematic inequalities, and lack of access to health care and education. And number three, the South has an indescribably rich culture unto itself in our foodways, our music, and art, in our landscape, our, world, our work, and our communities. I went to Boston last summer with the coming of age youth and Marion and some wonderful adults from this congregation. It was a pilgrimage trip, a chance to see monuments of our religious heritage firsthand. If you've never had the chance to do this, I highly recommend it. To see our faith tradition so embedded in the history of a community was an incredibly powerful and foreign experience after growing up UU in places where there are not many of us. The only other place where I've ever gotten that sense of history and resonance is at Shelterneck down near the coast. I think it can often be lonely to be a religious liberal, with the little L, in the South. And this may be magnified for my generation. We fit somewhere along a spectrum that is drowned out by the increasingly loud voices of both evangelicals and militant anti-theists. And this is where I'm thankful every time that in Southern culture, it's somehow appropriate to inquire even to an acquaintance what church they go to. <laughs> Every time I thank my God, my sense of the divine, and launch into an explanation of a church that believes in a vision of love and truth and compassion so powerful that it transcends damnation. In my journey to learn more about our faith, I've been fascinated to learn about what Unitarianism and universalism looked like at different points in a history. How have those faiths changed? Who believed in our values? And in what communities were these faiths attractive? In their respective theologies and perspectives, I've come to see Unitarianism as the head and Universalism as the heart. Unitarianism is and was concerned with questions of reason and intellectual understandings of justice and meaning. Universalism is about love. It's about compassion and nurturing the bonds that link each of us to each other. Universalism had a broader reach across this country and more adherence than Unitarianism. It's always kind of strange to, think, strange to me to think of our religion in the context of evangelizing, but Universalists were pretty successful at spreading the message of, of this it's sort of all-encompassing love across the South and across the country. 
So this brings me to the essence of what I want to say. I declared earlier that the South is my home and it's complicated. It might be for you as well. For some of us here, the South is important as a place and as a space. For some of this, or for some of us, this is where we come from, while for others, it's a stop along the way. So here's why the South is my home and could or should be yours as well. There is work to be done here. There is work to be done in the South and Unitarian Universalists are the ones to do it. This is our legacy. In the civil rights movement in the 1960s, UUs responded to Martin Luther King Jr.'s call for a coalition of people who value peace and justice to be actively involved. Two UUs were martyred there, witnesses to the, to the often painful path towards justice. In the late 19th century, realizing the problem of limited access to education in rural communities, Unitarians and Universalists set up residential schools in the South. The one you're probably most familiar with is Shelter Next School, which was set up by Abby Peterson and other Unitarian women from Boston so that children in Pender County who couldn't get to Burgaw could still get an education. In recent years, members of this church and of our broader faith community have marched and have been arrested in Raleigh as part of the Moral Mondays protests, speaking out against policy that discriminates against the poor, African Americans, Latinos and Latinas, women, seniors, and students. This is our legacy. We are people who see injustice and show up and speak out to raise consciousness and change. The South is our home, not only because it is a diverse and strange and paradoxical place, but because it needs us. It needs people who care about education, the environment, issues of equality and civil rights, labor issues, I could go on. The South needs people who care to change the rising tide of injustices perpetrated by the privileged few on the struggling many. And so this is my South. This is what it's like to live here. This is why I live here. The South is my home, and it's complicated. <laughs>